If you have a smartphone, I would love it if you would use the app. How many of you guys, just by raising your hand, have the Nsika app? Boom, boom. This is awesome. Look at that. <laughs> You're already succeeding as entrepreneurs just by having <laughs> that app. Um, I want you to rate this panel, and th through your ratings, that will determine what we put out on the Nsika <laughs> podcast and so YouTube <laughs> <laughs> and some of the other ways that we release information from Nsika. I want to thank you guys all for coming today. Uh, I'm going to give short intros for each of these fine ladies here, and then they're going to go into much greater depth. Um, this panel is Making It, Artist is Entrepreneur, and it features moderator Kayla Stein from Sonoma, California, Sunshine Cobb from Sacramento, California, <laughs> representing California in the house today, uh, Kristen Kiefer from Baldwinville, Massachusetts. You got applause. That's awesome. <laughs> nice. It's got the rowdy ones. And <laughs> Meredith Host from here in Kansas City. I want to remind you all that they are showing in the expo. You can find their work as well as find them walking around the expo at different times. Um, at the Clay Studio for Kayla, uh, Sunshine will be at Objective Clay, Kristen at 18 Hands, and Meredith at the Kansas City Urban Potters. So I'm going to turn it over to Kayla, who will take over the panel. Hello, and thank you for attending Making It, Artists as Entrepreneur. Thank you, Ben, for the introduction. Ben's broad understanding of our national ceramic scene through his podcast, The Red Clay Rambler, has provided us convenient access to, to so many artists and their studio practices. When I was planning the panel, I approached Ben as a sounding board for which artists would be a good fit for my expectations, and he verified that these three women would be dynamic, insightful, and strong examples of self-made entrepreneurs. I would like to, to thank Ensika and say happy 50th. The work of the board and the staff is extremely valuable to our field. I've been attending the conference since 2001, and I feel honored to be on stage for the first time this year. My background in ceramics is versed, including formal academic training, residencies, apprenticeship, teaching in university and community situations, and running a design and production studio. My experience working with others has always been the richest, and especially through mentorship and peers, figuring out my studio business in real time. Currently, my most fulfilling role as director of ceramics at the Sonoma Community Center is as a mentor to the artists in residence. Our residents typically come to us after an undergraduate or graduate program and are seeking supportive work environment as they launch their careers in clay. Opportunities such as these are critical to the success of young artists, facilitating invested relationships and setting up a trifecta between community, artist, and education. In our climate of conscientious consumption, farm-to-table politics, and the bi-local movement, there is a heightened awareness around local goods and how vital they are to our communities and economies. Consumers give their support through purchasing power and find gratifying relationships through bonds with local businesses. More than ever, artists are equipped to market and operate their own businesses, and career options have expanded beyond traditional gallery formulas and academic service towards a fertile ground of entrepreneurial opportunity. Our three panelists are here to offer informative, straightforward information about their businesses and experiences from the beginning of their careers to the present. These women offer insight into strategies for success, geographic diversity, and approaches to the lifestyle of a working artist. They have each charted their own courses, marked by a combination of committed learning, collaboratives, publicity, and most of all, risk-taking and sacrifice. Unarguably, persistence and the ethics of their craft bring them to the center stage of contemporary American pottery. But by no means are they offering formulaic solutions for a successful career in clay. This is up to the individual as the proprietor and creative genius. Sunshine Cobb is from Sacramento, California, and has been a full-time potter for four years. Meredith Host lives here in Kansas City and has been a full-time potter for nine years. And Kristen Kiefer lives in north central rural Massachusetts and has been a full-time potter for 13 years. This panel will be conversational between the panelists and the images from all three artist studios and lives will be rolling on the screen as they speak. 
So I'd like to start the panel by asking each of the panelists to talk about pivotal moments or decisions that impacted their careers in clay. And we'll start with Sunshine. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Um, okay, well, first of all, thank you guys for showing up. Holy mackerel. Um, it's awesome to see you all here, and I hope we answer some questions or share some craziness that is our lives. Um, so basically, like, we we're talking about pivotal moments and that idea of how we became uh, sort of self-employed artists. Um, and for me, that was kind of like a slow road. I went sort of from being uh, graduating from school um, at, to basically unemployed and then figured out that I was self-employed at some point along the road. Um, and a lot of that came from basically getting jobs that I couldn't support myself. I was teaching adjunct and miserable and um, not feeling successful and not being able to make work. Um, and I sort of went a, sort of a short road to some residencies programs. Um, uh, so I did like a short-term residency in Sonoma, actually where Kayla is now. And... Uh, and I just couldn't figure out how to make life work. Um, so I applied to the Archie Bray, and for me that was a huge sort of moment in my progression forward because I applied not necessarily with the idea of making a body of work, but trying to figure out if I could actually become a working artist. Um, and so I spent the, my two years at the Bray really trying to figure out if I could make a living um, and in a subsidized, safe environment um, for myself. So for me, that was key because in addition to that, um, I also <laughs> learned very much about what I actually needed for a studio so that when I left the Bray, I've been able to sort of, and I'm only about a year and a half out of the Bray now, um, but I was able to sort of fine tune exactly what I needed to make a facility for myself. And um, that was sort of my very short path, but. Um, some pivotal moments. Can you describe what you're doing in your studio oh. now? So currently I'm opening a studio called uh, Sidecar Ceramics um, and I crowdfunded, uh, did a crowdfunding campaign in order to uh, facilitate that because I didn't necessarily have the startup capital. Uh, so after I left the Bray I sort of found a studio about a year ago, it's actually a year ago uh, this month and uh, have been slow and steady building up the studio and uh, making it a space that I hopefully is a good place to work and, uh, and that it's a sort of work in progress. I feel like the actual hard work is coming soon uh, when it's actually up and running and I'm looking for people to be there, so. That's me. Thanks. Okay, hi, I'm Meredith. Um, so, pivotal moment. I think it goes back to being in grad school at Ohio State University and um, I accidentally started a business while I was in grad school. Um, I'm going to try to make a long story short. Um, I decaled a few restaurant dishes for a clay um, club sale that helped to help bring in visiting artists. And um, actually, they're up here right now. This is the stuff I'm talking about. Um, and the sale was canceled. There was a snowstorm. And I had just recently opened up an Etsy shop. This was early 2007 um, to put like older studio work up there. And I wasn't totally convinced I wanted to put my name on it yet, um, a Meredith host shop. So I called it Folded Pigs and just a random old email address I used to use. And I threw these dishes up on Etsy and they sold immediately. And I started getting requests for more. And people saying, are you planning on making more? And I said, no. Um, but <laughs> I was like, oh, well, you know, it wasn't that difficult. Um, I could maybe, I could make a few more. Well, it snowballed into um, promotion and being early in the, on the Etsy site. And um, yeah, this accidental business started that I kind of embraced. And it supplemented all my costs through grad school. Um, and so then the actual pivotal moment um, came at the end of my time at Ohio State. I was talking to Rebecca Harvey, um, who was the head of my grad committee, and she said, well, what, I knew I was moving back to Kansas City, and she said, well, what are you going to do when you go back? I said, well, I mean, get my old, try to get my old job back, and she said, why would you do that? I'm like, what do you mean? What else am I going to do? She said, okay, you obviously have this product that there's this demand for, and why wouldn't you give it a go? And I mean, I think I needed to hear that from someone I trusted to give me the confidence to say, yeah, I'm going to try this full-time studio thing. And so in the fall of 2008, I went full-time in the studio, and now I split my time between Folded Pigs Dinnerware, which I call my commercial retail line, and Meredith Host Ceramics, which is my, you know, studio artwork. Thank you. I'm Kristen Kiefer. 
So I became a full-time studio potter, or I declared myself a full-time studio potter in 2003 when my last artist in residency ended and I had the opportunity to move into a rental studio in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, my plan from the beginning was to, <laughs> sorry, was to be adaptable and open to change. Um, my main goal was to make whatever I want to make and make that work and supplement that. My, my precise, slow process was supplemental income that was hope, hopefully potter related. And to give you a sense of what 2003 was like for me, um, I was still shooting slides. Um, galleries were still taking 30%. Um, Etsy and Facebook didn't exist. Um, I thought my main source of income was going to be doing craft shows and I hoped that teaching at a craft center was going to be my consistent income. And so an example of being open to change would be that in 2009, the craft center where I, che where I teach abruptly closed because of the recession. My husband and I were both teaching classes there. He's a furniture maker. And our combined income from teaching there was paying our mortgage. So fortunately, my dad in retirement became a videographer. And I said, hey, dad. <laughs> so um, with my dad, um, we produced my surface decoration how-to DVD. And so that's become, uh, that was, became a makeup source of income from teaching. So subsequently, the craft center where I teach did reopen a year later. Um, but so I've been doing this for 13 years. And what I make, how, how um, excuse me, how, how I sell it and what supplements it has changed significantly. So I was sure in 2003 that I was going to be doing cone 10 soda reduction for the rest of my life. I now do cone 7 oxidation. Um, I sold my craft show trailer and bought a snow blower, which has been much more useful for me in Massachusetts. <laughs> um, I primarily sell my work online, which again, wasn't, you know, none of us were aware of that then. Um, and so I'm able to teach locally part-time, I teach workshops nationally, I sell a DVD internationally, and I sell work primarily now online through my Etsy shop, and then I also sell at studio sales through exhibitions um, and gallery consignment. Nice. Um, well, I wanted to talk about social media, and Kristen, since you mentioned that none of that existed when you started out. Um, could you, t or could any of you talk about um, how you use social media and how it's benefited your business and your sales? Sure. You want me to go? Sure. I'll start. Um, okay. You go. can start. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start. Um, so I think when we talked about, because we sort of practiced a little bit, um, when I talk about social media, for me it's a big part of what I do and how I am finding myself in the world as far as getting uh, people interested in my work. Um, and I think, you know, it's one of those, for me it boils down to advice. Like, some people are really into social media, some people aren't. Um, and what I've found is, like, you have to sort of practice at it. it, it to my, my advice comes from a sort of, like, if you are hesitant to do it, do what you're comfortable with. Um, a lot of times if you're starting out in the world, um, and especially with your work, I think it's, it, you're really hesitant. And at first I was really hesitant too until I sort of figured out, I'm just going to put work, what I'm interested in seeing. That's sort of how I started. Um, and I do mostly Instagram because that's, I like taking pictures. And so that's something that's really interesting to me. Um, when I first got out of school, I started blogging. And I was a terrible blogger because I hate making content. Like, you have to have content in order to blog. And um, so after I'd been blogging for, like, six months, I, Goog I Googled myself, and there were just pictures of my cats. And I was like, that is unsuccessful. So I was like, I need to figure out a new strategy. And so I stopped blogging because I was terrible at it. Um, and, uh, you know, when Instagram came around, I was sort of doing Facebook and stuff. Um, but, you know, I take a lot of pictures. I sort of... I, consider myself kind of an image hoarder and uh, the first year I had my iPhone I took almost 10,000 pictures. So I'd like to share a lot about the, sort of the story of my making process in addition to POTS. Um, but I think it just, you know, for me it's like take practice, you know, I take a lot of pictures and share the ones I think are, are good. So, But it, uh, the, both those things also sort of <clears throat> hit different audiences for me. Um, as far as like Facebook, sort of, there's a lot of people that take workshops from me. Instagram is sort of a younger audience. Um, so part of it's just trial and error. 
A lot of it's timing, too. In your case, like you started your full-time business about three years ago, and maybe that was around the same time Instagram really became popular, too. So it happened together and sort of launched. I think so. I mean, it could have. I never, I don't pay attention to that stuff, but yeah, (laughs) it could have. (laughs) Meredith or Kristen. All right. Um, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Instagram also. I mean, you know, being a visual person, I just like looking at pictures. <laughs> um, but I have found, just to add a little bit extra, I agree with a lot of what, you know, Sunshine said. Um, I have linked my you know, Instagram to my Meredith Host Ceramics Facebook like, like page thing. And so it, it takes off the pressure of feeling like I have to, um, you know, update a million different things. <clears throat> and I was hesitant at first to have a Facebook page um, dedicated for like the business. But um, I found, or I, you know, personally, I don't necessarily go and check out everyone else's website every day, but I know that I check Instagram and probably Facebook every day. So it was just an extra way of, you know, having contact with people or getting information out there much easier than just putting it on my website. Um, I'll echo a little bit about what they said and just a brief evolution of how I've used social media, which has become crucial as, as a self-employed potter who does, all, well, Meredith sometimes has assistance, but all of us do all of our making, marketing, photography, shipping, all of that kind of stuff. Um, being able to have a little bit of that control of the marketing with social media has been huge and, and life-changing for me. Um, and so I also started blogging and started my Etsy shop in 2000, 2007, 2008 when those began um, and did pretty avidly blog and it was an important part of steering people to the release of my DVD, which to date is my highest, um, uh, uh, most seen blog post that I've, I've done. Um, but then as they said, people don't want to read anymore, so blogging isn't, <laughs> isn't as useful as it used to be. Twitter and Instagram have made us more visual people with less words. Um, I'm very conscientious, both with blogging, newsletter, and Instagram, who I'm communicating to. So I'm, I'm marketing for workshops as well as selling my work, and those are the primary reasons I'm on social media. Um, so when I'm, when I'm posting in-process pieces, I imagine that I'm communicating to potential workshop participants and talking a little bit about what I might be teaching if they came to a workshop that my DVD is available. And then when I'm showing my finished work or work in action in the kitchen and that kind of stuff, I'm, I, and when I blog, I imagine I'm communicating to a collector. And I think having a sense of, of who my audience is when I'm writing and taking those pictures makes a big difference. Me, gives a level of professionalism and helps me articulate uh, what I want to get across with with that marketing. Um, And then Etsy for me, it's not not exactly social media, but that's another part of of that platform and steering from Instagram, my professional page, my newsletter, Twitter, and Facebook (laughs) to those things um, has been very important. I wouldn't mind adding a little about the whole Etsy thing um, because for me it's been really important in survival (laughs) as far as supplementing income. And the folded pigs dinnerware versus my studio artwork, um, they're definitely two different brands and I've chosen to keep those separate. So um, on Facebook I have a separate folded pigs page versus a Meredith Host Ceramics page and, you know, to separate business cards. I, you know, I'm not, it's not a problem that people know that I make folded pigs, so it's, you know, folded pigs by Meredith Host, but um, I try to keep them separated. I've had some galleries asked to carry folded, the folded pigs line as well as my work, and I've kind of steered clear of that. I try to alleviate some of the confusion that can happen, and I also know that it's a totally um, different audience that these are, lines are directed at. So knowing your market, um, your audience, um, different venues. Like I have done a lot of the indie craft fair circuits um, with folded pigs, um, like the renegade craft fairs and things like that, um, to you know, the difference of mine, doing a little more like local um, art fairs and definitely promoting all of those on social media. So local and national audience. And Sunshine, you sell online, but not through Etsy? 
Uh, no, not through Etsy. Um, I also just wanted to add a mm -hmm. quick thing. Um, I think one of the things that's sort of great about social media, too, is it forces you to sort of start taking pictures. And I think, uh, you know, when I first got out of school and I tried to build a website, I had no content to do that. And so I think what's been great about, t like, taking pictures of my work and taking pictures of uh, where I go in the world and what I'm doing, I had a re I now have a, a, like a sort of well of information that I can build websites with and make postcards. Those are big things. Um, taking pictures, I think, is an important part of, uh, I mean, social media, but it's also about figuring out how to sell your work, but also the uh, how you're going to connect with people. Um, so I just wanted to add that. But, uh, you know, I didn't have much success with Etsy. I found it... Um, very difficult to navigate and try to get, you know, the, by the time I think I hit Etsy, it was, there was just millions of people on it. Um, and I find it very, uh, it was a challenge. I couldn't type in Sunshine Cobb and actually find Sunshine Cobb, and it made me crazy. So I just decided to have my own website and um, just uh, try to figure out how to get people to me. And luckily, I have a pretty memorable name, so it was yeah. easy to, relatively easy to do that. So, yeah. Um, I was looking at your website this morning, Kristen, and it is packed full of information. It's great. You have writing about how your work connects to a rebay pottery. You have just a lot of resources. You have your, you know, there's just so much in there. Um, so I think that's, what well, can you talk about how kind of um, beefing up your website with these other elements besides just sales um, have helped you? Well, I try to, I try to use social media and, and use my website uh, and write for when, when I search for other artists, what am I looking for? And so I get students asking me questions. I want to answer questions as much as possible on there. So I have information about my process, which is a very frequently asked question. Um, you can see how to buy my DVD and, the, and how that is on there. Um, I just want to be able to answer a lot of questions on there, because I know when I go to somebody's website and I can't tell if they're on social media, where they live, um, who they are, and that kind of stuff, it gets frustrating. So I try to answer all of those questions as, mus as much as possible so c people can get to know me through that format and then maybe contact me if they would like to. Um, and then I, I do still blog. I, I, stu I do still like the idea of that's what can keep a website current and make it change is that you're, you're kind of changing that content a little bit. Because if a website is always static or you haven't updated it since 2009, nobody's going to go back. Um, so I'm always trying to add new images that way. Um, yeah, I think those, those are the main things. Um, <laughs> Um, I have a question about mentorship and how it has supported and continued on as a valuable resource for you as an artist and as a business person. Anybody? I can take that. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so, looking back, I learned most of the business aspect of things when I've worked with other potters. So, um, I had a little bit of time with John Glick in Michigan. Kristen had a lot of time with him. Um, I also uh, assisted Julia Galloway in her studio practice um, when I was a resident at RIT. And it was in those times where I learned, you know, dealing with galleries, how to pack work properly, um, you know, different types of shipping, uh, you know, the, the practical things that you don't actually necessarily get in school, or at least I didn't. I think now it's becoming a little bit you know, more prominent to talk about these types of things. Um, but that mentorship was really important um, for my business now. And so when I, I have an intern every once in a while through Kansas City Art Institute or someone might contact me and we set up a time where you can come hang out with me in the studio for uh, like, you know, an extended period of time. And I always am trying to talk about those things, knowing that that was really important to me, like the actual business side of things like really fun stuff like taxes <laughs> um, and, you know, just like, just the really practical things that you don't get. Um, so for me, I think when, uh, from my background, I grew up, my family had a retail store. We, we owned a pet shop. And so I think I didn't get any of the sort of business stuff. I mean, when you're in school, you're training to become an artist, not necessarily an entrepreneur. And so I sort of have relied on my education of, of growing up in a, in a retail environment. And so that's helped me. But I'm also very 
uh, when I don't know something, I kind of try to dive in and, and learn a learn about it. So I listen to a lot of business self-help books and things like that. Um, and I've just, and I do the sort of trial by error. I sort of try it and if it doesn't work for me, um, then I don't do it. Uh, or I sort of try another route. Um, and, you know, and other products, like Meredith said, you know, we get together and mostly we talk shop, try to figure out how, how each of us is making a living. And um, I think one of the first times when I got out of school, I actually met Meredith at American Pottery Festival, and a group of us were out, and it was just so amazing to sort of hear all the different avenues that everybody was going down to try to make a living. Um, but there is no one sort of way to do it, and it's a very diverse sort of, uh, it's a difficult sort of thing to make a living outside of the academic field. And so it was uh, really helpful to sort of talk to other potters about that. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of, and I do a lot of goal setting for myself too when it comes to business. You know, I'm always sort of trying to think about, okay, this, I'm, I do sometimes do the New Year's resolution thing, but a lot of times it's often business related where I'm saying, okay, this year I'm going to try this thing. And, um, and then I really work towards making that happen. Like an example is uh, one year I was trying to, trying to get, sell more work myself and less in the galleries. So my goal was to, instead of sending the maximum number of pots to shows, I would send the minimum number. And then in addition to that, I set a goal to sell 500 mugs myself versus that idea of like what that base income would be for me if I sold that. So, you know, so I devote time to that where like in January I would make, I made 500 mugs and then tried to sell them throughout the year. And so those are really good things to sort of think about the practical, practical nature of the, your economics, right? Like, okay, how, you know, it's a really difficult thing to sometimes think when you're, you have to put on that dis business hat versus the artistic hat, and, um, and sometimes it's not a very pretty hat, but it's okay. <laughs> so. Um, so I won't repeat what Meredith said, but just the, just the idea that if you know that you want to be a studio potter, finding a way of working with one <laughs> is a great way of learning about that. So I did have the fortunate opportunity of spending a year with studio potter John Glick in Michigan, and um, that was very crucial for me. I, I really kind of knew through school that I wanted to be a studio potter. I didn't want to pursue a professorship. I do enjoy teaching and, and wanted to do that in a mode of workshops and, and teaching part-time at a craft center. Um, and to echo what Sunshine said, there are so many different ways of doing pottery. Um, so, for example, I worked as an intern at a historical potter for a year, throwing historical pots. The master potter that was there had been there for 25 years and loved his job. He was making historical pots. He was making pottery for a living, but it was a totally different format. Um, I knew, it sounds a little strange to say, but I knew I wanted to be a nationally recognized studio potter. And what that meant for me is applying to exhibitions, pursuing opportunities that would make myself more visible, um, sending postcards to people, old professors and magazines at the time when postcard, you know, this is again before social media, um, <laughs> which led to me getting articles in, in magazines, led to exhibitions. So there's, there's different things that you can do based on how you think you'd like to position yourself in our field. I have friends that have gone to graduate school that thoroughly enjoy being the local studio potter in, in the area where they live. Um, so there's just so many different ways about going about this and how, um, how you like to work as a maker, how you like to use social media or not is going to impact um, how you position yourself. Um, well, I think you also, over time, you figure out where your skills lie. You're sort of, you know, like I fell into workshopping. I didn't really know that that was something I was going to do. Uh, when I was in school and I was invited to do a workshop at Utilitarian Clay where I met sort of my objective clay people. And, um, and it ended up being a skill that I was able to develop and, and something I thrived at. And so for me, it's been a huge part of my journey forward. And it's like being open to those opportunities and, and realizing, oh, I kind of enjoy this. And so it pushes me in, a, in different directions depending on um, what I'm interested in doing and how I'm interested in spending my time. I can probably chime in from a really different perspective on this one because um, I have my degrees in ceramic art, but I am more of an organizer and a facilitator in terms of my work or how I educate. So organizing panels like this, seeing a need for um, certain programming or um, interaction with different communities, 
motivate, motivate me to do things kind of beyond my comfort zone. So, you know, it gets me out of the studio, it gets me collaborating with other artists and educators. Um, so my role as a, working at a community center program, um, I'm able to um, maybe diversify how I give back to the field too and try to make time for my studio work. But it's, that's just sort of in my DNA, is to be the, an organizer. <laughs> Sometimes we can't fight that, that's just what it is. Um, let's see. I'm going to throw out the question of where do you see yourself in three years? Oh God, we're already that part? But I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna... I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so for me, um, I, uh, in three years, yeah. So I have no idea. Uh, I sort of, I'm hoping like, okay, so I recently did a crowdfunding campaign and started, I'm starting the studio, Sidecar Ceramics. Um, so I see for the next few years that really being something I invest time and energy into. It's funny how basically a year of building a studio isn't actually the hard work. The hard work is now figuring out how to make that a successful business in addition to me um, you know, part of workshopping and things like that, I travel quite a bit, so I have to sort of figure out how to ease back on my travel and actually be where my business is. Um, so yeah, so things for me are changing and trying to shift to a more local sort of environment for myself. In addition to, I think I'm developing a bit of a uh, sort of intern situation at my studio, um, trying to give back more locally to folks in my area that are interested in moving forward in clay. Um, and yeah, no, I just, I feel like I'm still going to be working, making pots, um, but I, I'm really trying to sort of shift and focus to maybe less national and more local. I, you know, I live in California and there's a really strong uh, sort of farm to fork uh, movement there and I really want to participate in that because that's something I'm passionate about um, and I think goes along with uh, handmade ceramics. So. And I, I guess to kind of echo the um, local thing, um, that has kind of been important for me in the last couple of years. Um, you know, when I first started my full-time studio practice, it was 08, and I was sending all my work to galleries. Um, and I think it was 2011 where I was like, I am kicking ass this year. I've made so much work. I've sent out so much. And then when I did my taxes, I about cried. Aww. And I thought, okay, well, this model isn't exactly working. You know, maybe I need to reevaluate where I'm sending my work. Make, you know, the galleries that are actually selling my stuff, that's where I'll keep them. Because um, I think having still a gallery presence and not just all direct sales for me has... Um, been important just as far as staying visible in the field as well as it kind of generates um, workshop opportunities um, or visiting artist gigs, things like that. So just downsizing the gallery or making it more efficient, the gallery presence. Um, and then I, two years ago, decided to apply to art fairs locally here in Kansas City. Because I realized that my own town didn't actually know I existed here. Nationally, I think I had a presence, but not so much here. So um, just becoming more visible within Kansas City, you know, my hope was that, you know, some other time during the year, someone would think, oh, I have a wedding to go to and I need a gift, and think maybe they would contact me. And so far, it actually has worked, and I've actually done some fun commission work as well as wedding registries, like making a whole set for somebody, and it came out of the art fair thing locally. Um, I also, uh, in 2014, teamed up with six other potters here in Kansas City, and we are the Kansas City Urban Potters. Um, and it's interesting to take different people's skill sets. We're all full-time potters, but we're all you know, better at certain aspects of business. So teaming up and we accomplished so much more than what we could do individually. <laughs> and um, in April 1st, we take possession of a storefront space. And so that three-year plan thing, um, there, I hope to have a successful little storefront um, as well as, you know, an online business. Um, as far as folded pigs versus Meredith Host, a ceramics, which I always feel weird talking in a third person, but, you know, branding. Um, so, um, folded pigs at first took up a lot of my time because um, it was the thing that was generating money and actually allowing me to survive. 
And so I would say like 75% of my income in the beginning was folded pigs and 25% was my studio work. And I have switched that scale, which is awesome. This was the three to five year plan back then. Um, so now I'm at like 65% my work, you know, 35 folded pigs, which, you know, I'm happy that that actually the balance of the scale flipped the other way. Um, because ultimately that's what I want to be doing full time is just my studio work. So I think that three to five year plan from now is to try to tip it 100 maybe, or you know, 95, five. <laughs> we'll see. So I just wanted to backtrack a little bit. We each work in such different environments. So I'm kind of the old school modder of the lone studio potter in a house in the boonies. <laughs> um, I, we moved to where we live in, in really semi-rural Massachusetts because it's what we could afford, but it's within proximity of my husband's family and he and his job, um, which is a 45-minute commute, and where I was teaching part-time. So we kind of figured out where we could afford, and that's where we moved. Um, studio sales are kind of tricky for me, but my part of my three-year plan is to move towards being more visible locally and regionally, because I do live in New England. Regionally means I have access to four other states pretty easily. Um, but that's part of what being able to sell online has allowed me to to live in that rural community and still have access to, to customers very readily. So ideally for me, I would have studio sales or be able to participate um, in in a group sale with other people, but because I really am so isolated, that's not gonna happen. So studio sales would be the most ideal, um, the most direct way of selling, but my ne next most direct way of selling is through Etsy and online. Um, so even though I, I don't live near people, I live near a post office. So that's perfect for me. Um, we're doing some renovation at our home that will allow physically walking into my studio be a little bit easier because right now people need to walk through our house to get down into my studio. Um, so advertising kind of locally for people to come to the home is a little odd to have strangers walking through your kitchen to get to the studio. So part of my plan is to make it so that people can more easily literally walk into the space so that I can reach out in local papers and, and regional ways to, to sell my work and um, be kind of a little bit of the local potter. <laughs> uh, Meredith, you mentioned um, Kansas City Urban Potters and um, the benefit of working with a collective. And I know Sunshine, you're part of Objective Clay, which is also a collective, but instead of a locally, locally based collective, it's, how would you describe it? Yeah, so um, we, so Objective Clay, we basically met uh, almost four years ago at uh, Utilitarian Clay at Aramont in uh, Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Um, and so we sort of got together and it was at, you know, I think I had just actually come from uh, American Pottery Festival and, and that idea of all of these potters and people struggling to sort of figure out how to make their way, um, the idea was for us to sort of pool our resources, intellectually, financially, all that sort of stuff to support one another and try to figure out a way forward in the world. So Objective Clay is sort of half educators, half entrepreneurs, um, and we're all over the country from Hawaii to New York, sort of everywhere in the middle. Um, there are 12 of us, and um, we sort of come together and try to uh, collaborate and figure out how to uh, make opportunities for ourselves in addition to being a support system. Um, it's a difficult thing trying to run a business from all across the country. We try to meet once a month um, and sort of online and, and navigate that. And, you know, it's been slow going. Most of us, we were strangers when we first met. And uh, so it's been an interesting sort of trying to uh, move through that. And uh, But there, what I think kind of is our uh, saving grace is that everyone's really talented and kind of amazing. Um, and we uh, respect each other artistically in addition to figuring out our own way in the ceramic uh, field. And so um, uh, we're really sort of, I think, I feel like we're started, starting to hit our stride and uh, m sort of moving through some new ideas that will sort of make a way for us in the future, which is really great, so. Nice. Um, let's see where we are here. I think we can start talking about the, the income sources and some of the numbers. 
Um, We're sort of still, we still have a we lot have of pictures. We have a slide. <laughs> a lot of pictures. Our last that. slide is, uh, <laughs> no. includes pie charts and graphs yeah. with numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we can lead up to that um, with talking about, um, you know, diversifying the stream of income. And we've touched on quite a bit of that already. Um, and maybe even, maybe a, a good lead up to that would be um, talking about finding support through um, publications and um, by sponsorships. We were talking about this a little bit during our prep yesterday, how there's, um, you know, glaze companies and certain um, organizations that are actually sponsoring potters. And um, are you, do you um, have any sponsorships uh, or support like that? No, not, no, not really. <laughs> I mean, I think there's some wonderful uh, people in the ceramics uh, Field and like, sort of, I mean, they're all upstairs, so or wherever yeah. they are in the building. <laughs> yeah. um, they, you know, I think that's a, you know, if you're using product, I don't know, that's it's a weird question. I don't, I'm not sponsored. I have done some stuff for a few people, Amico and uh, Duncan and things like that. Um, I think they're, you know, they they sort of sponsor me in workshops and, mm -hmm. and things. So um, I do work with them, but it's not a source of revenue or income. How or, does that yeah. sponsorship come about, even for the workshops? Um, Talk to Stephen upstairs. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's just a thing. I think. I mean, part of like my. Uh, I'm out in the world doing a lot of workshops, so um, it, that is just a part of that sort of field of, of you know, exposing people to their products and mm -hmm. um, using them in workshops and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So. Yeah. Mainly, I've just had workshop support where I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna teach a workshop here or there, and. Um, can I get some underglaze, you know, and then I'll ship it, you know, directly to that place um, so that we can use it for the hands-on portion. But that's, a, that's mainly, that's about the sponsorship, I yeah. guess, you know, yeah. support for workshops. No, I think that's great that, um, that they're receptive to that. And, but, you know, it, it requires you reaching out and, and asking. Um, and in, it's a reciprocal relationship, though, because then all of those students will have an experience with their product. And I think... Um, I know, it's an important thing. I think that's one of the weird things about being uh, self-employed is that you have to sort of be okay with no. You have to say ask, and the worst thing they're going to do is say no. Um, but if they're not going to give you anything if you don't ask. I mean, and that's for everything, sort of. I think I apply that to almost every opportunity I have. I sort of have to ask for it and then uh, figure a way around if they say no. And But it's like that's a big part of... I mean, I think it's a big part of being an artist, too, is that you can't be afraid to fail or be rejected. You have to sort of apply yourself and, um, and learn your way through that. So that's a big part of being self-employed is rejection and failure. It's good. <laughs> it's it's yeah. character building. <laughs> How do you bounce back from rejection or failure? Oh, you don't, I don't sweat it. You just move forward and like, whatever. Somebody else will, yeah. you know. I try not to dwell. You know, you don't, <laughs> don't dwell on it, for no. God's sakes, no. Because it's like, I, does anybody know Arthur Gonzalez's work? He basically kept a whole, every single rejection letter he ever got and like doodled on them and he made a whole book out of them. I mean, it's brilliant. Like saving your rejection letters and making a book. I mean, yeah, it's great. I think if anything, rejections made me you know, think like, oh, maybe I need to hustle a little bit more, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Change the way I was thinking about things for the next time I applied. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, all of us have stacks of rejection letters. <laughs> that's, that's just part of it. Rejections from residencies, rejection from shows, grad schools, colleges, all of that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to do this, you have to be persistent, tenacious, stubborn, hardworking. That's, that's a big part of it. Um, and that's how, that's, you know, part of the, if you want to be a visible artist, applying to, applying to exhibitions, national exhibitions is a great way to do it. Those things sometimes get published, and a lot of times you might not get in. Uh, it totally depends on the juror, it depends on the work, all that kind of stuff, but you just need to keep trying. And um, you have to believe if this is what you want to do, that's, that's what you need to do. Yeah, I think it's a matter of priorities, right? I think that's one of those things about um, sort of the direction all three of us have taken is that uh, making work and uh, doing this for a living is a priority. And um, 
I want this more than I want a new car or a new house or those types of things. So I really have moved forward in a path that this is really what I want to do. And um, luckily, you know, you can change your mind. But, you know, it's sort of is kind of a, you can, you know, keep moving forward in this direction. And I think sometimes when you're moving in that direction, opportunities come up and doors open uh, when, when you stick around and show up, you know. I always uh, give it the advice to uh, for younger artists to apply apply to things that you feel like you can really that that that's at your level where you are now, but also apply to things that feel like a reach, so that um, you're putting yourself out there, you're setting your goals and expectations. Of course, some of those might result in rejection letters, but at least it's um, you know the jurors are looking at your work e- either way. So you, well, I, you get I, seen. Yeah, when I was yep. first starting out and applying to stuff, I couldn't actually afford to apply to any shows. I basically just entered, like, every website had a submissions page. So I just submitted, and I never got anything, like, directly from those submissions, except that my work made it to the laptop of somebody and that saw it, and then later I was invited to things. So, um, you know, I worked well within my framework of being a poor. <laughs> I was like, okay, i got to figure this out. Um, so that's a big part of it. Yeah, and just an example of a rejection letter actually turning into something. I, way back in the day, applied for the Clay Studio residency in Philadelphia, and I was rejected. However, they saw my work in the application and invited me to be in their holiday gifted show. And that was pretty early on, uh, before I went to grad school. So that was kind of like a foot you know, in the door um, as far as the gallery thing went. So... If I hadn't applied and gotten rejected, they would have never seen me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. and I think the postcard thing is still a good idea because we are inundated with so much social media that if you really want to get something into the hands of someone you think is important, you could send them a postcard of your work. There you go. I mean, it's old school, but <laughs> it's different now because it is. That's <laughs> weird. Yeah. <laughs> In every studio and, and all across this country, there's postcards hanging on the wall that somebody sees, that they go to your website, that you get invited to something. That's happened to me a lot of times. And I'm a good example of you can be shy and market. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll ask a question about custom work. Um, and Meredith already mentioned she does dinner sets uh, that came out of some of her exposure in Kansas City. But I'm wondering if um, Sunshine and and Kristen make custom work or do orders that are sort of beyond the norm? No. no. <laughs> I mean, I, when I say custom work, I should say I'm not, I'm still making something I would make, but maybe it's a particular color or a certain pattern. It's not necessarily totally different than what I would normally do. They come to me because they want a certain style. They want yeah. the look that I'm providing the design, and it's just maybe being a little more matchy with what's in their house. Yeah. <laughs> that type of custom. <laughs> yeah, I think it's in my future, but I don't currently do it. So. Yeah, and that's another good example of, of choosing a route that you would like to pursue. Again, I worked for Studio Potter John Glick, and a big part of his mis- business for decades was doing commissions for dinnerware. And so he would meet with customers in person or actually send out samples of dinnerware, work with these customers pretty extensively, and take those orders, keep glazes on hand for years in case somebody broke something, that kind of stuff. He, he liked that personal touch. I would not en- enjoy that. Can I get um, so so? Can I get the oh, last sorry. slide up, please? Yeah, that's. Are we done? Last We're slide. on no. the last slide. We'll just, well, we just want the last slide back up, but I think oh. it's also like we could take probably a couple questions. Well, the the last thing I was going to say is is that again, I, I don't take commissions, and we all get the question: Can you put a bullfrog with text on the side <laughs> of the thing? I don't do those, but I I do what I call requests. So if somebody is interested in. Oh. You know, you've done this mug with this stamp. Can I get it in this color? Those are things that I'm interested in. I, I would, I do those things. Um, but commissions is a completely different thing. Hmm. One technical it's, it's problem. A, kind of. <laughs> That's okay. This was, yeah, it was kind of a fun thing. We did this graph. We sort of, because taxes are soon, we all were like, oh, we can figure out our income for the year and do a graph for you guys. Um, and it was, <laughs> it's not working well, that's there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really fun to sort of, we sort of broke it down to like workshops, um, sales, direct sales, gallery sales, um, teaching. teaching. And yeah, and I, I didn't realize how important 
workshops were to me last year until I looked at the chart. And I will say with mine, mine is has not included the folded pigs line, so it's this is like a 65% pie. <laughs> pie. You just made so there is also another one. <laughs> Part of mine. <laughs> exactly. And you were saying a lot of your direct sales come from your workshops too, so there's a little bit of overlap there with bringing work to, to those learning um, experiences and selling finished pieces. Right, yeah, so as far as direct sales go, I didn't even include, I called art fairs a different type of direct sale too. So, um, and last year I only ran one Etsy sale um, for myself, which was in December, and it was kind of the first time I actually dedicated to my shop. I deal with the Folded Pigs Etsy shop daily, but um, there's something really different about running like a one of a kind, you know, piece you have to photograph everything is a different listing every single time versus something that I can reproduce fairly easily and just relist, relist, relist. So this year, I mean for 2016, I hope that that direct sale with my personal Etsy shop is even more because mm -hmm. I'm going to dedicate more time to that. I guess what I'd like to point out with this is, is kind of what we've been talking about for all of us. How we make a living is diversified income. Um, I, I think it, I'd be hard pressed to say that anybody could make a living just selling pots. So all of us do supplemental things to be able to make this work for us. Unfortunately, all of us are doing things that are pottery related. Yeah. Um, so my graph is a little bit different. And this year, 2000, so this is 2015, was my most successful year of selling online. So um, it, it, I'm, it was exciting to see that that was the biggest part of my income for this past year. And for me, the fairs part, um, I didn't actually do any, I don't do art fairs anymore, but was, uh, one of it was a pottery invitational. That to me is a category of those random things that we get invited to that we can't rely on. So it could be getting um, a piece purchased for a museum, um, it could be award money from a craft show, from a show, um, that kind of stuff. But that putting, piecing together a living through different ways. Like I said, I was relying on teaching part-time in a craft center and that stopped happening. So each, you know, having multiple ways to make this work, because there's always ebb and flow. I'm still feeling the result of the recession that we experienced. Um, that affected my prices, my price points, what I sell. All of us sell a lot of cups now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's what I would point out with that. If, you, if we're all set with the graph, we can take questions. And there's two microphones, one in each hallway there. And we have about we just need like one question, yeah. guys, to get us to the end here. We're so. there. Yeah. Somebody's okay. Right. Yeah, there she goes. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, you spend so much time, at, and I'm getting into this too, you spend so much time thinking about yourself. Um, what are the kinds of things you do to kind of get out of your head and like engage with the world and be a whole human being? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'll start that. Okay, so last year for me was a crazy year. I did uh, 17 workshops, and that means a lot of travel. Um, yeah, and by that's the, important with her graph. She did 17 I workshops, um, and so I, I did seven. <laughs> So I basically made the commitment to myself this year to take better care of myself. Um, so really, I'm like working out and going, being home by nine. I'm really trying to take when I'm home. I'm taking care of myself. I'm trying to put that into the uh, when I'm out on the road. Um, and so it, I think it takes almost just as much effort to really try to maintain your home life, and at least for me, maintain my sort of regular life. But it is. You know, I, I never fancy myself ambitious or a workaholic, but I actually kind of am. Why? I know, right? I, well, it's, I, you know, being self-employed means you work 10, 12 hours a day. Nobody works harder than the self-employed, and that's basically that's what we are. We run our own businesses, and um, it's it's kind of it's a, there's a lot of imbalance, so it's a struggle and a push for balance. Yeah, I really try to balance, and I'm not very good at it. I'm definitely the workaholic kind of, you know, in the realm of everything. But I, um, for my stress level, I do go to the gym quite a bit. Um, and then I can tell when I don't go that I'm even more stressed. <laughs> um, you know, outside of ceramics, 
I really like to hunt down some like antique treasures, <laughs> <laughs> taxidermy and thing, weird stuff, vintage glasses. It's all kind of homeware stuff, other than the taxidermy. But you know, I don't know. Like that's my one thing. I mean, I'm kind of clay, clay, clay all the time. It's hard to escape that. Yeah, oh, I'm, I'm not good with balance. Balance is always a struggle. There is no such thing as balance. I don't believe it. So. Another, another I don't question? Believe it. No. We'll take a question from this side. Hi, um, I had a question about how you choose to present yourself online and social media. So we're using these platforms that are really based to show about your personal life and how you choose to show aspects of your personal life on social media as well as presenting yourself and your name and your brand as a professional um, and how you balance using social media personally and professionally and then wondering when you show images of your work, what kind of images um, you find your customers relate to the most. So like set up like professional images or more casual encounters with your pottery. Where's that line between professional images and private images? Well, I found that I've kind of stopped doing private images. <laughs> um, I'm pretty, I, I try to be really thoughtful about what I put online as far as, I guess, personal stuff. Because, you know, our, my brand is me, and I think that that is also, you know, across the board here. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, really like my dog, but I'm not, I don't post pictures of her all the time, but she'll show up every once in a while because it is part of my life and, you know, a personality and um, it, it's a really hard balance actually. I pretty much stopped posting on my personal Facebook page entirely because I just haven't had time and I don't know, I don't know what it, it doesn't do much for me anymore so I have focused more on, you know, process shots and fun studio images and I found that I really like taking up pictures of multiples and it's like this volume that, I don't know I, when I look through my feed it's really colorful there's uh, you know mul lots of multiples and it's interesting when it's kind of like it's curated in a way and I didn't even realize it mm -hmm. I don't know yeah I think for me I tend to do a lot of um, I don't know when I started my Instagram account I, I was very I thought about what exactly I was going to do and I think there was a uh, there's a, a certain mystique or fantasy life that a potter has that uh, people outside our industry uh, sort of look at and see. And uh, I'm okay with, I mean, I have a weird life and it is the envy of some people. And so really it's that, that people are buying a little bit of the fantasy of they're supporting me in my adventure. And so I kind of like to share that adventure, like me traveling while, yes, it's exhausting. It's also something a lot of people don't do. And so I try to highlight the sort of nice parts of my life in addition to, and all of them, well I mean well, I guess most people do, whatever, it's Facebook um, but I do, I sort of really do try to include the people that are important to me in addition to, you know I do have rules about my cat, like I only do one picture a week if I do a picture you know, so I do set up some rules for myself because otherwise I would go uh, insane, so um, but I did start an, a, a, an account for my cat, so she has her own account that she posts on all the time so I try to limit myself that way. So um, I think it, everything is, the thing is, everything is out there in the world. If you put it online, it is out there. And so I think being very cautious about that is important too because, uh, you know, there's an intimacy that's set up that people uh, believe they know you in some fashion. And like now with the Periscope, people actually get a video into your world. And, um, and that's a, you have to figure out how much you can do that. And if that's something you want to do. And it's okay not to do it. It's just something that for me is a way to connect to people. And, and I, I tend to, I was talking to somebody about Periscope. And it like in a weird way it terrifies me. But in another way I'm like, I'm going to do it anyways and see if I can do it. Uh, so I sort of push myself. When I'm uncomfortable I'll push myself forward. Um, and then, then figure out if I can do it or not. So I don't know if that's helpful. Well, thank you everybody. And thank you for the questions. Yes. If if there are additional questions, we might be able to take some out in the hallway. Hallway or upstairs. Or yeah. upstairs. Yeah. Expo, Expo space. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.